I think I met almost everyone here. Um, my name is Jay Clark. I'm the Manton Curator of Prince Drawings and Photographs here. And um, I'm going to be talking to you a bit about the Works on Paper Study Center in the Manton Research Center. And if you, does anyone hear like tiny minutia details? You can hear about some of that stuff. It's my favorite. <laughs> See, print curators are known, you know, supposedly print drawings and photography, but print curators are known to be like obsessive about detail. So I thought um, part of what we'll talk about is how you go from a completely raw space to one. You have a brand new study center. You can do anything with it, with this, with the room, with the vault, um, with the galleries, and where do you start from, and where do you go, and how do you work with the architects and um, when Merritt first asked me to do this, I thought, oh, well, it's, is it really going to be interesting to people? And then when I started going through all the, the files um, of six years of correspondence with Annabelle Seldorf's office about this, I thought, there's some interesting things here, so hopefully. Um, but it's a nice, intimate group. If you have questions, feel free to jump right in. This is, uh, this is very casual. Um, so we'll start by looking at the study room um, and all the details that will be in the room. But then we're going to go on at the end to look at some of the forthcoming exhibitions, our first three exhibitions in the Works on Paper Study Center. So a little, little bit of a preview. Um, and for those of you like Jock, I know, who have waited for so long, <laughs> it will happen, we promise. It's going to be completely <laughs> spectacular, and it will be worth the wait. Um, so this um, Tucker, who was just miking me up for my reality TV show appearance, no, I'm kidding, um, he took this photograph, which is really quite quite amazing. Um, so I'm just going to sit down and get started. Um, just to orient you here, I, you all know where you are, but here's the auditorium. And here is, you know, when you walk in the main atrium of the Manton Research Center. What, then you walk in here, these are the new galleries, the works on paper galleries. And then right across from the auditorium, what used to be the cafe will now be the study room. Wonderful space, wonderful natural light. Um, so just to orient you where, what we're talking about here. So this is a rough idea of what the atrium is going to look like. It's going to be absolutely breathtaking. Um, and as you know, the Mansion Research Center is really, in some ways, the intellectual heart of the Clark. It's where the library lives. It's where the RAP fellows are, the research and academic program fellows. Um, so we really, the, the reading room or the atrium is really going to have that feel to it. You know, people can sit down on comfy couches with their laptops um, and, you know, be very close to the library. This gives you a sense of the study room. It looks smaller here than it actually is. And, of course, some of the details will, will change over time. But just to give you a sense, um, these cabinets here, which I'm going to show you details of some other ones later, the some of the art lives inside those elements here. So, you know, you have a lock and you open it up. So, and then back here, what used to be the kitchen in the cafe is going to be our vault, <laughs> which is kind of fun. So I remember going in there and, you know, one of the things you have to do is you have to make sure everything fits in the new vault. And, of course, when you move to a new study room, you want to have at least 25% growth. Um, and so that's one of the things we did is basically count all the boxes, the cylinder boxes where we keep the art, think about what parts of the collection might be growing more than others over the next 25 years, sort of imagining. Um, and then thinking about, all right, what parts do we need to expand? What areas of the vault do we think will we'll need more, do we need more room for growth? Because to have it built a new vault and a new study center with no room for growth is just not looking, uh, not looking into the future. So that's one of the things um, that we did. One thing that was very important to me, which you can't really see, um, is to have a sink where you can wash your hands. Because whenever I look at works of art in the study room, I wash my hands. Because you could get, you know, you could have some coffee on your hands, you could, you know, get makeup on your hands, anything could happen. And that just little amount of oil that is in your skin if you touch a piece of paper, you know, an Albrecht Dürer print from 1498, it could be there forever. It could damage the work of art. So, don't, don't you wear gloves to that kind of thing? That's a very good question. Some people do wear gloves. I don't personally because I find them less safe than just working with my hands. They, the gloves um, sometimes um, interfere. 
I think with, with my ability to, we're rarely touching the works of art. What usually happens is you have a, a mat, and you open up the mat, and then you take off a sheet of glassine. So usually you're not touching the art, but the staff who's allowed to touch, and touch the actual work, we have to make sure our hands are clean. But even that, there can be a lot of wear and tear on the mats just through the oils in your hands. So we always ask people to you know, wash their hands if they're going to be handling the art. And the way it used to be is you have to go downstairs, across the hallway, into the bathroom, wash your hands. So now we'll have a, we'll have a, um, a little sink there where you can wash your hands. Um, another thing we bought is, um, I always call it a magnifying glass, but that's the wrong word. Not a stethoscope, not a horoscope. Microscope, thank you. <laughs> We bought a microscope right after I got here because one of the things, one um, thing that happens a lot is people come in and they say, I have this work of art and I, and I know it's an original. And sometimes I just look at it and I say, you know what, it's actually photographic reproduction. And they're like, how, how do you know? And when you look at something under a microscope, you can see the actual pixelation, like in those old TV sets where everything was little dots. Um, so it's very helpful. Um, and sometimes you can't see things with the naked eye and you can't see things with a really good magnifying glass. Um, so it's sort of like, you know, CSI Clark, you know, we get to look at, have all these wonderful tools and pieces of equipment that are, that are great, great fun. And one of the wonderful things about, this, uh, about the new study room is you can have two separate spaces. So you can have an individual here working at a table, you know, doing research, or you can have a class over here, you know, a small group of people, or you can, you know, sort of take over the whole room. So there's different functions. Um, this is the wonderful natural light, and just, Fifteen minutes ago, I was w with my colleagues picking the color of the shades that will go on that window. So all these exciting details. You know, you may think, if you look at those shades right now, we basically picked the same because we want them to be slightly opaque so you can see through, I'm sorry, not, not completely opaque, slightly transparent so you can see through them, but you don't notice them as a color, not an element in the room. Um, so the funny thing about a works on paper study center is ideally you have lots of natural light to look at the works of art, but then you put all the works of art back in the vault where they're safe and sound with no light. So to have a Winslow Homer watercolor in the study room every, you know, once a month or something like that is no problem at all. But if you had it exposed to light for long periods of time, the watercolor would eventually fade. So natural light is, people always think, why do you want all this natural light in the study room? Because it's the best way to look at originals, um, you know, without sort of fluorescent lighting. Then what we'll also have is a screen that comes, uh, a blackout screen that comes um, right down here, and then there's um, slide projection. So if I'm teaching a seminar or who anyone's teaching a seminar, they can be looking at the works of art and then suddenly turn into a classroom. And I teach in the grad program one semester a year, and I usually have half my class in the graduate seminar room and half my class in the study room. So now I can have it all in one place because it's a very diverse place. Um, a diverse space. Now one completely geeky thing that I'm so excited about is more filing cabinet space. <laughs> if you have a file that you, like if you're in the, in the T area of our files, you cannot take one out or put one back in. <laughs> so we want to have a lot of filing cabinet space because um, each, each work of art has its own file. So, um, you know, I'm working on the, this uh, Whistler's Mother exhibition um, for the summer at the Lunder Center at Stonehill. And so there's a couple of our drawings. One, I, th I thought there was, it wasn't right. Um, I thought, you know, this probably isn't by Whistler. But, you know, it, it, people had sort of batted it back and forth. Is it by Whistler? Is it a fake? Is it a copy? What is it? So you take out this file and all the past correspondence from when, from when the Clarks bought it and gave it to the Clark in 1955 in there. So you have Scholar X saying yes, Scholar Y saying no. The ultimate scholar on his drawings, is her name is Margaret McDonald. And she was here about five years ago and said absolutely, no, uh, seven years ago before I came, said absolutely, definitely not by Whistler. So all this stuff is in the file. All this, you know, a receipt from when he bought it, all the, you know, um, correspondence from dealers, from donors, um, from, um, from scholars. So, yes? What about emails that would update you? Would you copy it and put it in the file? I always do. Um, or another thing we can do, we now have a database where everything is in the database. So you can scan something and upload it to the database. So you don't have to have a paper file. So it would either, now we're sort of in the age where we check the, the paper file and then we check online the, on our database because there may be, you know, for example, when we were um, cleaning out the vault um, of the old study room, we came across a number of old mats, you know, the things that, that keep the works of art in it. And you may think, 
this is not at all important. Why have these been kept all these years? They're taking up all this room. You never know what tiny little detail will become important. Like now, if you flip over um, a back of a painting that was once Nazi war loot and was stolen by, um, was taken by, taken, works of art taken by Hitler um, and his comrades, there's a very specific blue marker number. Well, it doesn't mean anything, but once you know that, if you've thrown the backing away, you've lost all that information. So in this instance, we've, um, we scanned everything, we photographed them, and we uploaded it onto our database. So all the information is in there as well. Yes, John? So taking the digital uh, uh, a step further up, um, having digital images of the, of the artworks themselves, the restoral systems yep. and so on, how much is that playing in research to people who don't have to examine the exact, you know, the object itself? Uh, and no, that's is a good. That, is that part of what's evolving, or do you always need to look at the object all the time from mm -hmm. your perspective? That's a good question. I think most people, most um, scholars, for example, that want to come in and look at an original, they often want to see the work of art and the file because they know that in the file are all this previous correspondence back and forth about that particular work. Every article that includes this work of art, um, every time it was exhibited, you should have a photocopy of the label that was up on the wall, have that in there, or at least have it in the database. So I, my, my hope and my belief um, is that in this digital age, more and more people want to see the original. The original is even more special. And one of the things I'm very excited about this study room is it's, it's not sort of hard to find on the third floor around a corner in a dark <laughs> room. <laughs> it is right on the main drag. You walk in the Manton building and it's right there. And what, what you don't see here, these are all, this is glass window and a glass door. So it says, come on in. We're not secret. We're not only for the fancy, you know, doctors and professors and everything in the world. And one of the things, as, um, as Peter knows well, we have been welcoming school-aged children into the study room for the last few years. Um, a lot of study rooms say, no, no, you have to be 18 or older, you have to have a letter of introduction, blah, blah, blah. We feel like the more works of art we can show young children you know, and have them come into the museum at a young age, up to the scholar. Um, so we really, we want to be very, very welcome. Um, yes? Okay. completely open to the public. Anyone can by come in by appointment, yes. I mean, if someone comes in and they say, I came all the way from Texas and I yeah. want to see this, I mean, we'll be as accommodating as we can all, mm -hmm. always. Um, but I think it's really important to be open to the public because these treasures don't just belong to the clerk. I think they belong to everyone. Is um, there any museum rules? You know, um, I would say of all the study rooms, let's think of all the study rooms I know in the US, yeah. probably 20% or less are open to the public and probably 10% or less let school-aged children in. Mm -hmm. But we're, we're very careful. Oh. I mean, obviously, you know, we, we're very sure that this, you know, especially if they're younger kids, I'd never let my kids in the study room, but <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but it's interesting. I mean, you, you can speak to this probably better than I can. Wouldn't you say this, the younger students are quite respectful of keeping their distance? Oh, very much so. They yeah. think it's such a treat. Yeah. They're, they're really blown away by it, by, by the, uh, the original. This is, this is an original drawing. Yeah. It's ruthless. Yeah. Wow. Uh -huh. Not under glass. <laughs> you know, not, not in a frame. Yeah, exactly. it is I mean, kind of amazing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and especially like the European museums, it seems like they are that that the you know the cabinets are open, but you don't know that they're there unless you've asked them there. So they're yeah. technically open to scholars and the public, but they're oftentimes behind closed doors. So you know, there's not an invitation to the people. So mm -hmm. the difference here will be that you you know that you have to come in. So yeah, and that's very uh, important. The, the, um, exhibition room Yes, let me show you that. Um, so when you walk into that, you're going to get A, you'll see right to those two. Exactly. There'll be a glass door. Um, we didn't want to have a whole wall because you don't want to feel like you're in a fishbowl, you know, with everyone um, in the gallery. So we're, we're going to get we're going to get to that next. But it's it's nice that it's adjacent. So there's like this obvious connection. I mean, at the Metropolitan, their galleries um, are adjacent to 
their study center, but there's a, there's a door and there's like a doorbell that you feel like a bomb will go off <laughs> if you ring it. It's not, not necessarily welcoming. Um, so this is, um, this is one thing that's very interesting to me. This is the study room that I worked in for 18 years um, at the Art Institute of Chicago. And when I came here to start this job, we had just finished renovating our study room and galleries. So that was very, very helpful for me in saying, all right, before we move, we've got to assess all our sounder boxes. We have to remeasure everything. I mean, I'd just done it um, over a period of about five years. So one of the things I was very interested in, um, A, are these ledges um, that you, and I'll show you some details later. So you can just put the works of art on the ledges, and we're going to have ledges all around the room. They're not moving, because right now the, the easels we have can move back and forth, but these will be stable and stationary and much, much more attractive, um, I think, as well. Um, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a quiz. Well, no, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, another thing we don't have are standalone easels, which you can see here there's a work of art on an easel. And what you can do in that sense is you can have a box with, you know, a box of Rembrandts, let's say, and you can take one out, put it on an easel, and just look at it or do a drawing of it, you know. So that's another thing we were having made by a, um, a gentleman whose name is Jose Bracco. He works at Yale. Um, and all of these things, you know, it's like I write my colleagues, who, make, who makes the best easels? Well, Jose Bracco at Yale, of course. I mean, everything is very specialized. So he's making these custom made for us. Um, and this all is part of you know, going into the budget, all the things that you really need to think about ahead of time. Now, there are, t this is my pet, <laughs> one of my interesting pet peeves, but I think it makes a big difference. So here you have this beautiful new study room that we're going to have. And you have, this is a custom made cart here, which matches completely. It matches the wood here. It matches. Um, sort of white, sort of formica there. And then, um, that was my office for many years. Um, and then, when we had too much art and we filled up this cart, then we started using these ugly Rubbermaid carts. <laughs> and I was thinking Tato Ando or Annabelle sort of creating this beautiful space and there's brown Rubbermaid carts, you know. <laughs> so one of the things I've been working on, you have no idea how long it takes to design an art cart that is both physically attractive and is not so heavy that you can't move it. Because this, this looked very pretty, but it was so heavy, we said, well, forget it. We're going to use the Rubbermaids. So that's another one of the things you know, we've been thinking about, um, some, down to some very, very detailed things. Um, another thing, you know, when you open up a cabinet in your kitchen, you, know, you have a pull. You have all these different ways you um, one of the things we realized we were thinking about the mill work is you need to have a little slit here so you can, after you open it, this is it closed and locked, you have something to be able to pull it open. Um, this is an example of the ledge here. Um, another thing that we didn't have at the Clark, um, most of our pastel storage is on, you know, they're basically in, um, in racks that don't move. So if you, and some of the, some of the Cassatt pastels, for example, or Degas pastels are very heavy and only one, you need two people to lift it. So if there's only one person working in the study room that particular day, the large box, you can't bring it out, the pastels are too heavy. So another, one thing we designed for this study room is drawers that very easily move back and forth. So you can show people the works of art or take something out and move it one by one instead of having a very heavy box. So some of those things we're able to sort of custom custom make for the space. One thing um, that I wanted to show you, this is a retractable ledge here, um, which you can sort of see goes up. Um, and when it's up, you don't see it. Um, and when it's down, you can put a work of art here and a work of art here. So we spent a lot of time, <laughs> um, and this is just an example of, you know, that s sometimes you spend months and months fabricating something. Um, and the biggest problem we had was this. Um, this mechanism here. We could fold it up, but it was always too difficult to fold down. So they made like five different prototypes of this until we finally arrived at one that, that was user friendly. And so what happens with this is it can be up or you put it completely flat down. Um, so it's, we ended up sort of creating our own system for it. But again, it, it, it took a lot of time. Um, and it's one of those things that will be invisible to everyone. But if you do it wrong, you know, you're not happy. Um, and this just gives you a sense of, it's probably a little bit um, pale. There's not enough contrast in this image, and I apologize for that. Um, but it gives you a sense of the layout of the room. 
So we have, where are we? Let me get situated here. So you walk in, well, let's do this. You walk in here, here's the monitor's desk. There's an individual who sort of works in the study room and there's two desks, so there's either the person who's there for right now would be Megan Kaczynski, who's our curatorial assistant. Um, and then we often have a graduate student that works with her. We have um, Williams College Art History graduate students. Two of them work with us eight hours a week, and we couldn't survive without them. They really do a lot of work. So then there's that big table where you could have a, cl have a class. Then here's the projection wall here, so the projector can come down. Then this is the area where it's a little bit quieter for you know individuals could be there. And then in this area, which you can't see back here, is the vault. And then these are the glass. This is the glass that I was mentioning that goes out to the auditorium. This is glass, and then this is glass. And here is the gallery, which we're going to be looking at in a bit. Um, another thing, as I mentioned, is to order all new cylinder boxes um, for all the works of art. Most of the works of art, these are the prints. Most of the works of art are kept in mats and then stacked one on top of each other in a cylinder box. Now, it may seem like, well, what's the big deal? These cylinder boxes are all made, custom made in two places, London and New Jersey. And they're called cylinder boxes because some man named Solander invented them to carry specimens um, back and forth from his various expeditions overseas in the Caribbean and Africa. Um, and they're com there's no dust can get in there. They're completely archival. But it's hard to argue for buying new cylinder boxes. It's one of those things that's like completely unglamorous. But if you have a cylinder box that's falling apart, you know, it's not good for the works of art. So what we tried to do is, you know, w with the renovation, make sure that we're moving with everything in tip-top shape. New cylinder boxes, everything looks really great. And what we usually have here in this little um, shield here is we have a little um, piece of paper that says, you know, what is in that box, 16th century German, 19th century French, et cetera. So this is how everything is kept in the vault for the most part. Yes? Through Matt's uh, data card, is that a full-time uh, position for you? I or? wish it was. <laughs> it is yeah. not. Uh, what we do is we have two preparators, but I mean, their work is mostly spent um, you know, moving the art, mounting um, exhibitions, mm -hmm. taking them down. So what, um, there's a contractor, his name is Frank Gregory, and when we need to, like for example, um, the Cowan, the Machine Age Modernism, he matted and framed all of those works. Um, so we usually, there's an outside person that does it. Um, and the reason for that is because you need special training to hinge a work of art. So let's say this is a, a deer drawing. Um, it's basically, there's two pieces of paper, acid-free paper, on which it is hinged at the top. Um, and then usually have a mat over it and then it's framed or not framed. But you have to have special training in conservation to be able to do that, which Frank has. Um, he comes in, so for the Van Gogh exhibition, which is going to have drawings in it um, from our collection and the Whistler's Mother, a lot of these works um, have not been matted or framed in a very attractive way. So we often use exhibitions as an opportunity to really upgrade the housing for that particular work of art. Um, and Frank's the person that does that. Well, right now, so if the, the exhibition space where the Machine Age Modernism right now, yeah. there is an actual wall, a sort of invisible door that opens up, and that's where the art transit is. That's where the preparation is. It used to be there in one building, and they had to go down an elevator, across the building, up another elevator, across here. Now they open a door and push a cart through. Oh, it's like yeah. heaven. They're so happy. And of course, when you're planning a new building, that's how, what you can plan, yeah. you know, to how, to, how to move the art around. Yes. Is it customary to remat or reframe works on paper for different exhibitions? You know, that's something that um, wasn't, I don't believe, was really done very often before I came here. But I think it makes a really big difference. And so now I try to um, put it into every budget of ex every of most exhibitions. Because if you have, you know, let's say you have a beautiful uh, Gauguin, a, a brown, sort of dark tone Gauguin print. And you frame it with a bright white mat. You see the mat. And I think if you put it in like a brown tone mat, then you're drawn to the art, not to the mat. So I think housing is very important. And frankly, it's not, it's really not that costly. Um, but I think it makes a big, a big visual appearance. And when you have a loan exhibition, 
you don't always get to choose what frame things are in. I'm sure you've seen in exhibitions, you have a series of works and everything has a different mat and a different frame. So we've been trying to do that more um, lately. Is there constraints to the artwork? No, no. And we also um, you know, use the opportunity of an exhibition to conserve a work of art. Let's say it hasn't been on view in a while and you see you know, some condition problem then that's the kind of thing we, we want to do before an exhibition, so to put, always put our, put our best foot forward. So for the Van Gogh and the Whistler exhibition, we'll be sending some works of art up to the um, conservation lab to... Um, so what happens at the end? So we just framed all of Rose's picture pictures, all yeah. the talent pictures and the musician is modernism. So she gets them back framed? No, we will keep the frames for ourselves and that will become part of our frame stock and they're great and we'll use them all the time. We're already thinking of other exhibitions we want to use them for. Like I think they'd look great with Japanese woodblock prints, for yeah. example. Mm -hmm. um, and then, exactly, and some of her works weren't even matted. Uh -huh. So she gets fabulous new mats, right. so mm -hmm. yeah, this is a good question. Um, so this is the gallery that we were talking about and this is the glass, the glass we were talking about, um, the glass door. And what we can do is we, we can build walls. We can, it's a very flexible space. Right now it's shown as just completely open. Um, but it's, it is a very flexible space, which has a lot of different um, possibilities. And this is the Manton Gallery, which you all remember has always been the Manton Gallery, which is right across the way. So that, you know, as we're, as we're planning for these spaces, they're all sort of the same vocabulary. You know, we were talking about this, this screen here that comes down. We have the same screen in the Mansion Gallery, the same screen in the museum building, the same screen um, in our study center, so everything has, you know, sort of in the, in the same family. <coughs> yes? How long before the exhibition do the works of art need to arrive so that we can do all this preparation? That's a good question. So for, for example, for the Van Gogh and Nature exhibition, all the works that are coming on loan will come, I don't know, maybe, three weeks before the exhibition opens. They'll be laid out, they often come with couriers who need to bring the works of art. Um, and once the works of art are here, if they don't belong to us, they're not going to come out of their frames. They are what they are. If it's a hideously awful frame, you're stuck with it. Um, so for a loan exhibition. For different kind, you know, if it's an in-house exhibition, it gives us a lot more flexibility. If it's all works from our collection, then we can conserve it, we can remat it, we can rehouse it, and th that's a really wonderful opportunity. Um, but for example, um, with a, um, the Machine Age Modernism show, we had all the work here five months in advance because we photographed everything for the catalog. Works of art were conserved, they were rematted, they were reframed. So it sort of, it sort of depends. It depends on the exhibition. So how am I doing on time? Okay. So um, I just thought I'd give you a brief overview of three, the three first exhibitions that will be um, in our spaces. And again, jump in at any point. Uh, I, so photography and discovery um, will be the first exhibition in this space. And this um, I worked on very closely with a graduate assistant whose name is Matt Cluck, who's now at the Getty in their photography department. And he, his love is, is photography, specifically the early years. So he and I had the pleasure of going through it. I mean, the, the first thing I did for this exhibition, I wanted our first exhibition to show the Clark doing something new. And photography is a relatively new initiative here at the Clark, new being about 15 years old. And we have a collection now of about 1,000 photographs. And it's really incredible, you know, when you pick out the most amazing things. So what, what we did is we picked out sort of the best of the best. Um, and so we picked out the best quality in the works and then we started thinking about themes around them. And I wanted a, a concept that was flexible enough to be able to show as many great works as we want, but not so flexible as to have no meaning at all. So one of the things that interested me is the very early years of photography and how photography was used in different ways, um, allowed people to discover different parts of the world that they had maybe never seen before. Um, so what we have here on the left is a work by Linnaeus Tripe. I think that might be a kind of fish, tripe, mm -hmm. is it? Yeah, that's his name. No, um, no, that's just oh, it's innards, okay, <laughs> whatever it is. <laughs> okay, <laughs> the poor man, <laughs> difficult name. In any case, he spent a lot of time in India and, um, and Burma, Southeast Asia, creating these beautiful um, salt prints. And this is called Ameripura, a street in the city. The city, it doesn't look like much of a city to us. And this is dated 1855. There was just a huge <coughs> exhibition at uh, the National Gallery in DC. It may actually still be up of his work. But there's so 
beautiful and magical. And because at the time, it was not possible to, create, to um, capture clouds, because anything that moved couldn't be captured. So this is all still. And then the clouds are basically made up by the artist in the negative. He paints on the negative um, in a variety of ways. But they're so, they're really magical works. Um, and this is uh, an artist named John Murray. And this particular work is called uh, Lake Nainital in the central Himalayas. And it was at one point um, thought to be a holy place. And what we're looking at here, it may look like a negative because it is a negative. It's this huge paper negative. And that's what the artists used to print. Um, they didn't have cellular, net or cellular film, obviously, like we had. So they would put this negative on top of a um, photo, photosensitive paper, expose it to light, and print it. But what you can't see so well here, but what the artist did is he actually painted black on the negative so that the sky would print white. And then he went in and added different pigments in here so it wasn't just black and white to create tone. Um, so he actually painted, and in some cases, like with Murray, the negative is the work of art. Um, and that's sometimes what's shown in exhibitions. So these are two very you know, unusual places that uh, Europeans and Americans would not necessarily have known that much about, um, specifically um, photo photographically. Um, two other places, you know, sort of thinking about place, photographic discovery of place. Um, on the left, we have Francis Frist's Pyramid of Dashmoor from um, a portfolio he did of um, Egypt, Sinai, and Jerusalem. And this is from 1860. And you see figures here in the foreground with these two spectacular, um, spectacular pyramids. And on the left, um, I see there's sort of interesting juxtapositions, although completely different. Of course, we know this very well, Yosemite. This is Carlton Watkins. And um, this is from the 1860s. And of course, they look much better in person. Another form of discovery was certain um, processes. So we're looking at specific processes that were discovered over, over photography's relatively short um, first 100 years. This is called a cyanotype. Um, and this is by a woman artist named Anna Atkins. And they're all this blue tonality. They're very beautiful. And what she did is she took this piece of photosensitive paper, put an actual fern, in this case, on it, exposed it to light. Um, and in some cases, the, the actual ferns um, exist. Um, so she was very interested in, in botanical imagery. And that, that's all she made. Um, and on the right is a daguerreotype, one of the earliest um, types of photography um, invented in France. And this is a family from Rochester, New York, from the 1850s. And daguerreotypes, this daguerreotype is about this big. And believe it or not, it's called the large plate <laughs> daguerreotype. We didn't have a large plate daguerreotype in our collection until a couple of years ago. A lot of the, the ones we had are the very small ones you sometimes see in cases. Um, but there's something about them. They're, they're, all, they're sort of mirror-like. They're very, very beautiful. The, the issue that is posed when you're showing daguerreotypes is you have to have very specific kinds of lighting to be able to show them. And sometimes you need um, a mirror. You need a light coming from the back. So that's some of the things that we're thinking about is what kind of cases. Um, and we're actually figuring that, that out right now, what kind of cases we'll put these works in. Did someone have a question? No. Um, I love it's detail. <laughs> if the clouds all went into one of these correct photographs 50 years ago, we make a big decision with that. Yeah. Do you formulate, who formulates the sort of mission statement yeah. that says the direction we believe we want to take in the next it's, 20 yeah. years is? And we're, we're doing that continuously. We work very, the curatorial team with the director, um, with the you know, with the blessing and the guidance of our board of trustees. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we just did that recently. You know, the question comes up, all right, we have, we have a new building. Mm -hmm. We have new space. Are we going to continue to collect the ways that we've always collected? Mm -hmm. um, and what happened with the photography initiative, I, I wasn't actually here at the time. My predecessor, Jim Gantz, really built an amazing core uh, collection. He's now at San Francisco Museums. Um, and the decision was made to collect in roughly the same areas that the Clarks collected. So American, European, um, up until about the 1920s. Um, so we're not collecting huge, large-scale contemporary photographs, for example. And part of that is we, we currently don't have space to hold them. Um, those require cold storage, and we don't have cold storage. So how can, you know. Um, but certain monies were given um, by the Board of Trustees to start building this collection. Um, and, and we've been growing it over time. So it's really exciting. It's been a really 
really fun part of my job because I was always a prints and drawings curator. Um, and this is part of my job that I've, you know, it's been such a great opportunity for me to learn um, and grow just personally um, working with photography. And it was, was it photography as it relates to what's in the Clark collection, in, in the Clark collection and what artists were seeing and what was happening contemporaneously? Not, not necessarily artists, although in some cases we do have, um, like we had this amazing portfolio of Aikens. We don't have, you know, so it's not necessarily artist per artist. Mm -hmm. Um, but certain kinds of art, like for example, this is by Roger Fenton. It's called an Orientalist Study from 1858. The Clark has very has a large group of Orientalist works, so that of course makes sense. Um, the interesting thing about this is it's an Orientalist study, and you have the Oriental rugs here. But then, if you look very closely, you see wires in the ceiling. It's actually just people from the street that he found in London and dressed up in <laughs> Oriental garb and photographed them. Um, one thing that, um, that we, this we bought um, not long after I got here, um, I think it's very interesting to think about photographs that had different functions outside of art. We know, this is a Charles Aubry called Still Life. Um, now we, these are collected as art, and of course they are beautiful works of art, but the artists actually created these specifically for uh, manufacturing um, and for other artists. So for example, this was created specifically in conjunction with um, Mir Sev for the porcelain manufacturers so that they had models of actual flowers um, to draw and to, and to use, and also for textiles. Um, so the second um, exhibition that we're going to be doing um, in our galleries comes from a wonderful new donation of 63 Japanese woodblock prints from Adele Rodbell, and this was recently in, um, in the newspaper. And this is uh, Rana Tolgan Ostheimer, who you all, I'm sure you all know, is the head of our education. This is Adele Rodbell who's from Pittsfield, um, and that's me, and this was actually in this room with the press sort of unveiling the gift. Um, Adele has been a docent here at the Clark for, I is 50 years correct? I think it's like 39 years. 30, okay, maybe I'm, you know. It's uh, the long, it's our long journey. <laughs> yeah, poor Adele. She, yeah, she, I'm so glad she's not here. But she is, she's so wonderful, um, and she and her husband lived in Japan, and they became very interested in Japanese culture and so, um, but they didn't necessarily collect a lot of prints when they were living there, but when she came home, then she started slowly building this amazing, amazing collection of Japanese woodblock prints. And she um, at one point said, oh, I'd love you to come to my home, and, and I practically fell on the floor when she took the first box out. I mean, just amazing works in beautiful condition, and it really is a new collecting area for the clerk. You know, we're really, we're really a very Western, we have traditionally been more Western based, um, but you know, with the with the Ando building and all these new spaces, um, it makes so much sense to have this connection. Of course, the Impressionists, um, Van Gogh, Whistler, Degas, Cassatt, etc. They loved Hiroshige Hokusai. They were very influenced by them. So it, it makes a lot of sense to have this um, as part of a new uh, collecting initiative for the Clark. So I'm just going to show you a few of these works, um, and because Adele kept them so carefully in boxes for so many years, they're in amazing condition. Um, and when she first offered to give them to the Clark, the first thing I did was um, we hired an outside consultant. Her name is Janice Katz, who is a curator of um, Japanese works, um, Japanese prints specifically at the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, and she came and reviewed all the works of art um, and did, because that's, that's what you, what a museum really should do. If you don't know about a spe specific area, we need to make sure that everything was okay. Um, not that Adele would have you know, cop bought fakes or anything, but just, you know, just do, do your homework. Because um, it's a big responsibility to take a collection like this, and it has to be done very carefully, obviously very seriously. So Janice came, and as she's looking through these, she's showing us comparatives that some of her prints are better than the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, better than the Metropolitan, better than the Brooklyn Museum, so they're really amazing work. So I just show you two Hiroshige's here. On the left, um, these are maple leaves at Mama from 1857. Um, and the view of a shrine, um, also from 1857, on the right. Um, and the print on the right, also by Hiroshige, we're going to have in the Whistler exhibition. Because Whistler was very interested in um, Hiroshige specifically. And there's, there's a painting he has where there's a woman dressed in a, in a Japanese sort of outfit with Hiroshige prints spread all about her on the floor. Um, and this sense of cropping, um, sort of unusual cropping, where you crop a whole side of a composition out and then you look into the beyond, that's a very... And you can see the Impressionists. You can see someone like Degas and Whistler very much um, followed in on that. 
Um, and then two more Hiroshige's on, um, we have irises on the left and plum tree on the right. Um, and Van Gogh made a painted copy of this Hiroshige. He was so smitten by it, and it's actually in the Van Gogh Museum. I've never seen them side by side, but um, the irises will, in fact, this work on the left will be in the Van Gogh exhibition because we want to show um, one of the things Richard Kendall, who's curating the show, is interested in looking at other artists whose forms of nature uh, Van Gogh um, is very influenced by. And now these artists may be less familiar to some of you, um, but this is also part of the Rod Bell collection, which really spans you know, 100 years um, of printmaking. So we have the Hiroshige Hokusai, um, and then there's also an artist, I love this particular work on the left, by an artist named Hasui. It's an image of a temple from 1925. And one of the stories that this, um, you know, that this group of Japanese prints can tell in the first hundred years is, um, you know, we have the influence of Japanese prints, hello, uh, influencing the French Impressionists, but then the influence comes back the other way. Um, you can certainly see it um, in this work on the left um, by Hiroshi, and this is Fujama from Gotemba from 1929. So you see the sort of influence, uh, the sort of cross-pollination of influence east and west. Um, and this is, we had a number of works from this artist um, whose name is Saito, and this is an image of Kyoto from 1955. Um, and you, maybe you can't see it in this print so well, but there's something very ando um, about a lot of these later works, um, specifically Saito. You know, he's very interested in architecture and very pared down aesthetic spaces, um, which very much resonates with, with what we have here. Okay, I'm gonna close up in five minutes so I ha have some time for Q&A. I always think I don't have enough to say, and then I run out of time. <laughs> um, so one of the other forthcoming exhibitions you may have heard about and actually seen already, it's an exhibition we did with the Frick Collection in New York. Um, during the period where um, our collection was closed for renovation, um, myself and uh, Colin Bailey, who was the former chief curator there, and um, Susan Galassi, who's another curator at the Frick, organized this exhibition specifically from the Clark's collection called The Impressionist Line from Dugat to Toulouse-Lautrec, so prints and drawings from our collection was on view in New York. Um, this is the catalog from it. Um, and it just shows, um, I'm just showing you a, a couple of works. But, excuse me? Things you know, I know. <laughs> this is the, a wonderful Dugas. You know, we've got this amazing Dugas collection here at the Clark. I have to tell you a quick funny story about this. When I came for my interview, so I may have told you this before. Um, my first interview, it was with um, Michael Conforti and Richard Rand, and they put all our Dugas drawings and one very special print now in the study room. And, um, and Michael's question was, if you could only keep one of these, what would they, which one would you keep? Um, and I've chose the one on the left because I think it's so rare and so unusual. It's from this early Roman period. Um, and of course, I was, <laughs> I was immediately told I was wrong, that this one was the right one. And so then I, had, then I basically argued and convinced them why this one was, I don't know who's right. I mean, fortunately, we don't have to do that, so we get to live with all of them. But it was kind of a funny, a funny quiz and actually a lot of fun. Um, and then this work on the left is a very beautiful, tender drawing um, of a young girl, again, very early in Dugas' career. Which one did Richard want? Um, he said uh, the ballerinas, the ballerina monotype, because that's what, what Dugas is best known for. I said, well, that may be his most popular work, but this is the most amazing drawing. Mm -hmm. Still <laughs> think I'm right. Anyway, <laughs> there's really no right or wrong answer, but I'll pretend I care. Okay, so here's a wonderful um, color woodcut by Gauguin, um, and this is called Manatu Papau, which translates to spirits of the dead watching over me, or watched by the spirits of the de dead, depending how you translate it. And here he has the Tahitian, this is when Van Gogh goes, to, uh, Gauguin goes to Tahiti. Um, you have Manatu Papau here in Tahitian. And then here, you can, it's hard to see, but there's some sort of, spirits, ghost-like figures watching over her as she sleeps. And some people think it's a, it's a kind of a nightmare. Um, so this is just a, a brief selection of works um, that will be in the exhibition. Two amazingly rare Toulouse-Lautrec prints. I mean, here you see um, a dance at the Moulin Rouge on the left. There's a gorgeous, gorgeous uh, color lithograph. Um, and one thing that's not very well known is actually two women dancing together, not two men. And on the left, uh, the seated clowness, again, a figure from the Moulin Rouge. Um, and she was um, a very colorful character, as you can imagine, um, in the area of Montmartre, where, to, um, 
the Moulin Rouge was. This is from a portfolio of prints that Toulouse-Lautrec did called L, which basically translates to the women or her um, in 1896, and it was all <coughs> images of the lives of, of a prostitute, which you can imagine then was very, very scandalous. But he spent a lot of time in brothels, and he, and he was friends with a lot of these women, and he, he portrayed them very tenderly, her very aggressively, in this very aggressive spread leg pose, which must have been quite, quite shocking. But Gore, I mean, they're the most amazing color lithographs. It's just uh, astounding. Um, and some lesser known works from our collection. On the right is a beautiful charcoal drawing by an artist named Bonvin from 1861, who it was a portrait of his wife <coughs> who's knitting. Um, but he was a very important artist during the Realist period. And uh, Lairmeet on the right, these are men taking a break at a wine press, who's a, just a fantastic uh, artist. And it was interesting because um, when we were choosing the exhibition, Colin Bailey and Susan Galassi kept saying, we just want the big names, we want the big names. And I said, you've got to have some surprises. You've got to have some people say, I've never heard of that artist. What an amazing drawing. Um, and actually, Lair Mead, the artist on the left, was very, very important to Van Gogh. He copied a lot of his works as well, very well regarded in his time. And the last two, um, two works that could not travel to the Frick um, because they're pastels and they're actually very, very delicate. Um, on the left is Mary Laurent in a toque, which is a name of a hat, an amazing pastel by Manet um, from 1882. And this is from a group of Pastels he did called um, Les Parisiennes, just beautiful women of fashion who he saw and thought were quite beautiful. And at many Manet retrospectives, you'll, you, always, you often see articles about these pastels, but you never see the pastels. They're so incredibly delicate because they're not fixed, um, as, as the Dugas is also not fixed. What happens with pastel, it's basically like powder um, that's you know, put in chalk form and then you use it to draw. And if you think of something akin to hairspray, a fixative is something that basically fixes the pastel onto the sheet of paper. And if these works are unfixed, you can imagine the powder can just come right off. So we're very, very careful about lending them. We can transport them within the museum and have them on view. And these two are on view in our pastel gallery right now. Um, but that's the kind of thing that we can do here at the Clark when this exhibition is on view, um, but we couldn't, couldn't do at the Frick. The, the conservators would not fix it if it's not been fixed. That's a very good question. Of course, the temptation is there. But no, that, that would not happen because it's not what the artist would have intended. And it also, it does something to the pastel itself. Mary Cassatt very rarely fixed her pastels and it has this powdery delicacy to it that some of the fixed pastels don't. Other artists like Odion Ridon, we don't have pastels by him in the collection, but hopefully we will one day. <clears throat> he would fix his pastels in certain areas very, very heavily so as slightly to discolor the paper beneath it and change the color of the pastel. So some artists use fixative for different reasons, um, knowing that the paper would brown more over time if you over, if you put too much fixative on it. You sort of th they would they would play with these fixatives um, in different ways. But sometimes in charcoal drawings, you s fixative is used. Um, there's one area here in the bon vin, which people were concerned when we bought this a few, well, maybe three years ago. People were concerned that it was a stain. But I happen to know bon vin always used a fixative right in the center of his image, and then there's this halo effect on the outside where it's white. So it looks like the paper is damaged, but it's actually just the way that he applied fixative. So I think those are my last two. Why not end with one of our most <laughs> famous Dugas? <laughs> um, but I hope I give you just a little flavor of things to come. I can't wait. We're all very excited, and there's going to be really more of an opportunity to foreground works on paper here at the Clark and our, our amazing collection. So come on back. And you said your date, your opening date really is an opening date. We are, um, you know, because of the Manton, as many of you know in the Manton building, um, for example, that we need to redo the skylight. You know, whenever you start a construction project, this happens, I'm sure you, you can all relate to this, this happens in your home. You start something, you open a wall, you realize, you know, you whoops. have, whoops, something's in there we didn't, you know, we didn't think. So, you know, we're, we're very much hoping that um, this fall we will have a wonderful new study center um, and galleries. So, but they're working. I was there today. They're working very hard and it's all coming together. Um, but one of the things um, that um, is happening at the same time in the Manton building is making sure everything is up to code. So, for example, there are bathrooms that it, were not wheelchair accessible. Certain areas where, you, and of course, you know everything has to be up to code in, in, in a new building. So that's that's another thing that's um, that's being worked on. Oh,
Exactly, and at the level that we're doing, and it's, you know, yes, it, it delays the process a bit, but it's gonna make it even better, even more lasting. Um, and, you know, these, this day and age, you just, you can't have spaces that are inaccessible. Um, so, yes? Exactly, yes. Okay. It will be as you have known it, yeah. And then the big space where you're showing stacks up on the edge. Yes. Those are library books. Those are library books, exactly. And the, and the idea is that space, as it was originally constructed, was meant to be basically an empty atrium. And because, you know, the Clark became, um, you know, more and more populated over the years, we had the information desk. And then, you know, you know but this far better than I. Um, but then you had, you know, the, the cafe function came in. So what we're trying to do is bring that building, what Annabelle is doing, is bringing that building to its original purpose and its original function, to have it as a more open space. And again, it's, when I say it's a sort of, it's the Manton Research Center, it's sort of the, the thinking mind of the Clark. I mean, yes, we're allowed to think in other buildings too, <laughs> but it's where the library is and the fellows and the study room. So I think we want that space to be more, um, opened up to be more of a library space because now the admission desk in this building serves that function. It's no longer needed there. Right. Yes. Great question. Are you going to have the wall of pastels like we had on the, over there, which were all permanent and just didn't? Yes, we will have that as well. And I'll show you um, what we often had. We don't have as much space uh, devoted to it, but on. Yeah, it's right there. I yeah. Saw it. On this wall, we'll have, we'll have um, pastels, and then we'll have a screen that comes down. So they're not being overexposed to light, but they're there, and you can you know, yeah. put the lights up on, or um, put the screen up. I thought that was really helpful. It is. You didn't have to keep bringing it out and back and forth. Yeah. Yes, I, I completely agree. Because they're heavy and they're delicate, and they should not be moved. Mm -hmm. They really shouldn't. And the, uh, the workshop paper is all stored here during construction? Yes. No, they're all here. We were very, very careful. You always want to keep everything on site as 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 much as you can. Um, How big is that collection now? Um, there are a thousand photographs. It's about seven thousand, five thousand prints, and one thousand drawings. No, I'm sorry, two thousand prints, four thousand, and one thousand photographs. So, and growing. And it grows every year. It does grow everywhere. You know, you have an amazing gift like, um, you know, like Adele just gave us 63 prints. We, you know, at the end of year, we received a total, I think, of 75 gifts. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, the, the collection is definitely growing. An exciting year. 63. 63 um, Japanese woodblock prints. And you're actively buying? We do buy, absolutely. Yeah, we just bought. Um, this last meeting, we bought a Grizz painting. We bought two German Expressionist prints. Um, we have an early 19th century uh, Dutch, or late 19th century Dutch pastel coming in for purchase consideration. So we do buy. We buy prints, drawings, um, and photographs. So How do you shop? Because that's a, it's a tough, <coughs> very responsibly. It's a huge geographic and chronological range that I'm responsible for buying. Um, so as you're to your point before, we have a list of this is what, you know, the collection really should have. This is what's missing. And then you have opportunities that um, you can't quite imagine yeah, right. that you can't pass up. Exactly. Um, so I go, well, I go to New York. That's where I do a lot of buying. And I try to be as strategic I can, as I can about going to art fairs. So there's, a, there's drawing fairs, there's photo fairs, and there's print fairs. Mm -hmm. And you know we don't. Uh, it would be irresponsible financially of me to be traveling around all the time, only buying. So I try to use the fairs as effectively as I can, because they're the most important print dealers in the world, from Germany, from Spain, from New York, right at that fair. Um, sometimes print dealers come here, and we, we buy directly from them. And then a couple of weeks is the photo fair, so I see everything I could want in, in one fair. Where do they have the fairs? Um, there's two fairs at the Armory. Uh, there's a fair in Paris that I don't often get to because um, it's in March. It's a difficult time. It's Salon du Dessin in Paris. And then there's Old Master Drawings Week, um, which is in New York in January. So I try to really hit those and spend two full days talking to the dealers, looking at everything. Um, and is that at the Armory? That's at the Armory, both of them. Both of them. Yeah. yeah. So in two weeks, I go to the photo fair. And it's great because you get to, you know, you meet collectors, you meet dealers who you get to know. You get to see all your curator pals. I should say it's all hard work. <laughs> So hard, <laughs> so difficult. No, it's a lot of fun. And I learn a lot going to fairs, too. Not even what we're buying, but learning what other people are buying or learning about artists you've never heard of or up-and-coming 
exhibitions, things like that. I meant, uh, I have a lot of questions now. We'll oh, good, that's fine. Uh, because I'm thinking, uh, you know, so uh, when you go to these shows, are there prices? Yeah. Uh, so it's not like auction. No, there's prices, there's stated prices. Um, do you get to negotiate, or isn't it that kind of thing? Though? No, I, I always negotiate. I mean, if you can get a lower price, you can. I always ask for a 10 to 20% museum discount. And usually people will give us one. Because they want their, dealers want their works of art to be sold to a major museum. Yeah. Because, um, you know, they can. So yes, we can negotiate. And frankly, now there's so much on the, on the internet. If a dealer tries to sell us something, and I know he or she bought it for $50,000, and they're trying to sell us to it for $250,000, say, forget it. We're not, it's way too much of a markup. We know what you paid for. Oh, but I conserved it. I did this and that. So, um, you know, you, you have to know the market really well. And there's some dealers that just are very, very overpriced. And you only buy from them if it's something you will never, ever see again. Um, so you have to be very strategic. You know, we don't have all the money in the world to be buying things. And you have to do it very carefully. It's one of the hardest, um, it was one of the hardest parts of my job to learn. The art history I know. I know how to write a book. I know how to do an exhibition. Um, but buying art is a very different kind of thing. Um, Do yes. No, because it's really important to see the work of art um, and to see the condition of it and to see if it's been bleached or something like that. So, and what we do here is a work of art. I'll see a work of art somewhere. It doesn't end there. Um, I'll come back. I'll talk to usually talk to Richard about it, our chief curator, and I'll say I saw these seven things. I think these two things should be sent. And we discuss whether, you know, w if we have the money to buy it, um, whether it makes sense. And then, let's say those two things are sent. And we get them on what? We get them on consideration, yeah. exactly. Consideration. And so the dealer will pay to send the work of art here. And then if we decide to send it back or send one back, that then we have to pay for the return shipment. And so then at that point, we show it um, to Michael, Richard, Richard, Kathy, and Michael, I, Michael and I usually meet and discuss it. And then if we decide to purchase it, then we do uh, a write-up that's sent to the Board of Trustees, and the Board of Trustees ultimately accepts or rejects the possibility to purchase. So it's a very, it's a very long process. And believe there are many times that things come here and they go right back out the door. There's one dealer, I saw a work of art that Richard and I always thought would be very important to have in the collection. And he said, you, this is so important. I know you've been looking for it for a long time. He sent me an image and I said, I know that thing has been bleached. And he said, oh, not that I know of, not that I know of. I'm not gonna say who this is. And I said, if it's bleached, we're gonna send it right back. And so I have something called, we have something called a black light. So we brought it into the study room. You put the black light, turn the lights off, put the black light under the print. You can see it used to be covered in great big brown marks, but it's been so badly bleached that it, you can't tell anymore. But that what that bleach does, it can go back in and degrade the paper. So that will be sent right back. So we do a lot of, we do a lot of research. And every once in a while, I'll ask Leslie Paisley from the Conservation Lab to come down and, you know, puzzle some things out with me, you know, if I want a conservative point of view. So it's a, it's a, it's a fun part of the job, but it's, it's serious business, you know. It's, it's <laughs> Sometimes people do. There's some. Um, we've become friends. I've, I've become friends with um, uh, photography collectors, um, Bruce and Delaney Lundberg, Lundberg, who are from Connecticut, um, and they they know the Clark and they are happy about what we're doing. They're excited about what we're, what we're doing with photography. Um, or one of our trustees, um, uh, David True from the True Family Foundation. Sometimes I will say we we want to buy this particular work. Um, you know, maybe you don't have enough money to buy it, and they will give us an additional amount of money, or they'll give us money to buy something. Um, that's something that, that's happening more and more here. Um, at the Art Institute of Chicago, that's really pretty much how we bought. People bought things for the collection, um, and or, or from, you know, endowments, endowed funds. So. And this is Karen Thornton. Yes. She's coming here. She's also, right? giving many of them as gifts, not all of them, but she's going to be giving many of them as gifts. But in the meantime, but that's only no, th some of them will stay here. Oh, they will. Um, when the show closes, they will stay here. And <laughs> yay! <laughs> I have to say, as I made me so happy. I was in the um, dropping off my my uh, my kids at school today, and someone came by who's quite involved. Um, you know, she doesn't work here at the museum, and she goes, "Love the show. Love all those women artists here at the Clark." <laughs> I'm so glad. <laughs> made my day. Can you give us your list? I've given her my list. <laughs> <laughs> We'll <laughs> see what she says. No, it's the one, th one thing that's so great is, you know, I've become friends with this woman. And when I go to New York, I pop by and I visit her. We spend time. You meet such wonderful people. And you, you know, whether it's dealers or donors or, you know, 
people like yourselves. It's it's a great job. I keep saying I shouldn't get paid for it, but I do. <laughs> so I don't want to trap you all here. It's 435, but I'm happy to answer any other questions um, that you have. If, if you all, those of you who have to take off or you're sick of hearing me talk, <laughs> please do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was so much fun. Thanks.